Okay, hi everybody. I think we're just going to wait one more minute as we're uh, expecting people to join. I'm just going to hold on here and uh, I hope you all have food in front of you or glasses of water or coffee or, or whatever will sustain you over the, over the next hour. Um, we'll just give it one more minute. Okay, I think I'm going to start. Um, welcome to the ISD Experimental Lakes Area Virtual Seasons Launch. Uh, it is so great to see so many friends, partners, alumni, and staff out there. Thanks so much for joining and for your time and for your interest in ISD Experimental Lakes Area. Um, if you get a chance, let us know where you're connecting from in the chat. It's always great to see how many countries and cities and towns and field stations are, are represented uh, at this event. We are very pleased to once again be celebrating the season with a virtual season's launch for the ISD Experimental Lakes area. As most of you know, our busiest time of year is the open water season when the ice is off the lakes and scientists, students and visitors flock to the field station to do their work and see what we're up to. Of course, not everyone can make it in person uh, to the site. So we're very happy to be able to reach out and connect online to give you a glimpse of what's happening for us this summer. A couple of notes of business to start. Um, as we have done in the past few years, we have a combination of pre-recorded videos and are also connecting with people live from ELA. So fingers crossed that the internet is going to work for those out there. Um, and for me here in Winnipeg too, sometimes there's more problems in the city. Please type any questions that you may have at any time over the course of the presentation into the question and answer box. Um, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end uh, and all, we'll do our best to answer any questions that you may have at that time. Also, a huge shout out to Emily Croft, who is helping on the back end. If anyone has te technical difficulties, please reach out to her directly in the chat. That's Emily Croft. Finally, uh, this presentation is being recorded so that folks who are not available right now can watch it later. And we'll be posting a link uh, on our website after the event. So uh, the theme for today's launch is old and new. For those of you who've been around ELA for a while, you know that we have a long history of rolling up our sleeves and figuring things out with the tools and equipment we have on hand. As you will hear today, we have instruments that were made in people's garages. We have tools that have been used since ELA started in 1968. And we believe in getting kids' hands dirty as they learn and figure out applied science on their own. However, that does not mean we're stuck in the past, even if 90s music does come up on our playlist from time to time. We firmly believe in innovation and the importance of incorporating new technology and practices into what we do. This does not mean transitioning from old to new necessarily, but rather celebrating the strengths of both, always learning and testing and figuring out what works best for us. Today's launch is a celebration of exactly that, the tools and practices that are critical to our work, both those that have stood the test of time and the new technology and innovation that's helping us collect more data, understand ecosystems better, and reach more people around the world. So to get us going, we're gonna start with ISDELA's Education and Relations Program and hear from Juliana and Emily about how we're connecting with kids, both getting their hands wet at ELA and reaching out to those around the world. Every summer, we invite up to 10 high school students to participate in our ELSE program, the Experimental Lakes Student Experience. These 10 students come to live at our site for two weeks, where they learn science firsthand by joining our scientists in the field. They learn about nature, field sampling, the scientific method, and more. But the coolest part, the students actually get to be scientists themselves by building their own research questions and collecting their own data from the Experimental Lakes to answer it in the form of a final project. We're looking forward to this year's cohort joining us later this summer. 
During the COVID pandemic, we saw a lot of new technology emerge for delivering educational programs online. It was in this environment that ISD Next was born, a program for youth all over the world who want to learn about sustainable policy. ISD Next programs are delivered entirely online, allowing youth from every continent to connect over their shared love of the environment. This year, we implemented a new Zoom plugin that automatically produces live translated captions in over 20 different languages so that a youth who speaks French, Mandarin, or Hungarian can participate in our programs without even speaking English. It's crazy what technology can do and how it is helping us bridge languages and cultures. With ISD Next, it was pretty unbelievable to see the interest around the world. We promoted the program in the fall, thinking we'd have a small group from Canada and Switzerland, and before we knew it, we had youth registered from over 60 countries. We had to very quickly sit down, regroup, and think about what sustainability might mean for youth in China or South Korea or Kenya, and how this could be incorporated into the program. It was a very challenging and yet exciting problem to have, I can tell you. Um, we're launching registration for the fall uh, for the next ISD Next, and so if you have youth that you think might be interested in this program, tell them to watch our website in late August. Up next, we're going to go to the chemistry lab with Emily and Jenny uh, to hear about some of the old and new technology that they've been using this summer. Hi, I'm Emily, and welcome to the Experimental Lakes Chemistry Lab. Here in our third pod, we have our dissolved inorganic carbon apparatus, which we use to measure the inorganic carbon in our lakes. So to do this, we inject our sample into a small amount of acid, and then the acid converts all of the inorganic carbon to carbon dioxide. And then ultra pure nitrogen flows through our machine and strips the carbon dioxide from the sample and it flows into our detector, which we then analyze um, the results on this computer. And if it, this machine looks homemade, it's because it was. It was made in the old chemist garage, but it is actually one of our most reliable and important um, analytical units in the lab. Oh, sorry, didn't see you there. I was just admiring the auto sampler on our new high pressure liquid chromatograph. Uh, so unlike our DIC, dissolved in organic carbon apparatus over there, uh, this machine will automatically sample each of these little vials that we place in here, which saves a lot of time. Uh, and then once it, once it uh, samples one of those, one of those vials, uh, the sample is then taken up through a long column uh, and the sample then separates into its constituents based on uh, the affinities of the constituents for the stationary phase of the column. Uh, and then once everything is separated, uh, it is detect sent up to our detector up here, our conductivity detector, uh, and then based on how long the constituents have uh, been in the column for, um, and uh, with how much of a signal we receive, uh, we can determine the identity of that uh, constituent and how much of it is in there. Uh, and so speaking of auto samplers, over here, we also have our MT100, which is another workhorse. Um, and so our MT100, we use for measuring conductivity, uh, alkalinity, which is the buffering capacity, uh, ability of our lakes to uh, buffer acid and um, turbidity. Uh, and so as you can see, rather than doing those three analyses manually for each sample, uh, the MT100 saves a lot of time and uh, work power by auto sampling for each of those analyses. I love that video so much. These poor students, they didn't know that they were going to have to be uh, video movie stars <laughs> in addition to working in the chemistry lab. So thanks so much, Jenny and Emily. That's so great. Also, a huge shout out to Mike Staten, who built the DIC analyzer in his garage and, and I hope is online. I can't quite tell who's all there. You may also be interested to know that Mike continues to pioneer in innovation with the LA. 
shout out to Mike Staten, Ray Hessline, and Ian Davies, who are working with us in Red River College to design and develop a low-cost sensor to develop dissolved oxygen carbon dioxide in water. Uh, CO2, as you many of you will know, is an important greenhouse gas, and the development of low-cost approaches will facilitate their more widespread use to better understand the role lakes play in storing and emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Okay, we're going to take a break from old and new, and we're going to go to Vince Pallas, our head scientist, to hear about what's happening at ELA this summer. Over to you, Vince. Thanks, Pauline. Uh, we do live um, sort of bizarre lives here. 30 minutes ago, I was on a lake sampling water for one of our current experiments that I'll tell you about in a little bit. Uh, and now I'm sitting in here in an office talking to you. This is amazing. Uh, before I tell you about some of the projects that are going on at the Experiment Lakes area this year, I just want to acknowledge that our Winnipeg headquarters are located on uh, Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oja Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, but our experimental field station, the ISD Experimental Lakes area, is in Treaty 3 territory, again, the homeland of the uh, Anishinaabe Nation and the Métis Nation. Okay, can we go to the first slide, please? So I will just want to go through quickly uh, some of the projects that are going on here at ELA this year. It is a very busy field season here this year. We said that for the last three years in a row, but I can't imagine what we would have thought three years ago if we were here today because it is crazy busy. The first project I want to talk about, uh, it has to do with plastics. Uh, you know, one of the biggest environmental issues today is the volume of plastic waste finding it, our, its way into our environment. And we know that many levels of gov government have mandated reductions in single-use plastics, drinking straws, lids for, um, you know, coffees, etc. But plastics that are in the environment already continue to break down into smaller particles. And of course, we continue to manufacture plastics. When those plastics break down into very small particles, less than five millimeters, we call them microplastics. And strangely enough, the fate and the effects of microplastics are not really well understood. And so Chelsea Rockman, scientist from the University of Toronto, is leading a study to examine the potential ecological effects of three different types of microplastics. So they're looking at polypropylene, which is uh, positively buoyant, it floats. They're looking at polystyrene, which is neutrally buoyant, it sort of hangs in the water column. And they're looking at polyethylene terephthalate, which is negatively buoyant, it'll sink to the bottom. And they're also looking at the additives that are put into these plastics to make them more stable under uh, exposure to sunlight. So this is the third year of the studies at ELA, but the team has already compiled some really interesting data. For example, the graphs at the right-hand side of this slide uh, show the body weights of fish. These are yellow perch, juvenile yellow perch, that were not exposed to plastics. That's the graph that's at the top here. Uh, those that were exposed for 10 weeks to microplastics, uh, including their additives, that's the graph in the middle. And then on the bottom, fish that are exposed to microplastics without additives. So the fish exposed to the microplastics were at the end of the 10 week exposure, about 10% smaller. So their growth was affected after only 10 weeks, uh, but the additives that were in the plastics didn't have an extra effect there. So that is an enormous uh, project with lots of graduate students, lots of different PIs working on that one uh, here at ELA. So go to the next slide, please. So one of the reasons that the Experimental Lakes area was established was to look at algal blooms or what we call eutrophication. Uh, algal blooms are globally ubiquitous. They're found across the, the world and they're among the leading causes of ecosystem and water quality degradation here in Canada, North America, and again, globally. The blooms, the algal blooms can produce toxics, um, toxins that are harmful to humans, to livestock, to pets, and they also create low oxygen conditions in the bottom of lakes that make them unable to support uh, cold water fish that of course need that oxygen. So ELA throughout the decades has been instrumental in guiding the science and the policy around managing algal blooms. Uh, and in response, governments have implemented strict phosphorus controls. And these have been largely successful in, in limiting algal blooms. This project, the Lake Remediate or REAM project, is being led by Scott Higgins, who's a senior scientist with ISD ELA, along with professors from a number of universities. So Louis Malott from York University, Sherry Schiff from Waterloo, Jason Van Katzwaren from Wilfrid Laurier, and Helen Balch from the University of Saskatchewan, amongst many others. It's a very large project again. 
The project really addresses a scientific controversy that's emerged about whether reducing nitrogen in our wastewaters will be effective in reducing, in reducing algal blooms. So it's very expensive to remove nitrogen from wastewater. Uh, for example, the upgrades to Winnipeg's North End Sewage Treatment Plant to reduce nitrogen loads to Lake Winnipeg are expected to cost more than $11 billion. But the effectiveness of that change is unknown. And so this project is really examining how effective and in, under what conditions limiting uh, nitrogen loads will be effective in limiting algal blooms. Uh, next slide, please. This is a project that uh, I'm helping to lead. Um, this is a project where we are collaborating with Myera, which is an indigenous company in Winnipeg. We've been doing this for several years now. This is, I think, the third or the fourth year. The overall goal of this project is to preserve and in some cases to reintroduce cultural foods uh, to indigenous peoples in order to protect their food security. For our part, ISDLA ELA this year is looking at the possibility of reducing water use to culture wild rice, culture wild rice. That's kind of an um, oxymoron there, but I'll explain a little bit. Um, wild rice in the US, where we import a lot of our wild rice from, is grown in flooded paddies uh, as an alternative to wild rice that's grown in lakes or wetlands. Um, it's thought that the optimal depth for growing wild rice is about 30 centimeters of water, but we're looking at ways to reduce that water use. And an added benefit of this project is that less water use will also reduce the production of potent greenhouse gases, CO2, carbon dioxide, and methane. And that's because the overlying water that allows oxygen poor conditions to arise, that facilitates bacteria to produce greenhouse gases. So just to put this in perspective, if we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the rice industry globally by just 10%, that would be the equivalent of removing 40 million vehicles from the road. So this is a huge, huge contributor to methane. In fact, uh, to greenhouse gases, the, the rice industry. In fact, it's on par with the aviation industry. That's a staggering stat, I thought. So this year, what we're doing is growing two different types of wild rice in mesocosms with 30, 20, 15, 10, and 5 centimeters of water overhead. Uh, and also growing it in soil that's just saturated and even in soil that's only wetted every other day. And we've been, the plants are starting to come up this year and we've been measuring greenhouse gases in the water and in the, the uh, soil moisture as they grow and we'll be able to report on this uh, at the end of the year. Uh, next slide, please. So at in the experimental lakes area, we work to identify topical issues that relate to human impacts on aquatic ecosystems. And this project is a really good example of just how quickly we can mobilize to provide needed scientific information. So just two years ago, a chemical in stormwater runoff was implicated as a potential cause of salmon uh, die-offs on the west coast of North America. The chemical 6-PPD uh, was identified as an antioxidant. And this antioxidant chemical is added to the rubber that's used to make tires to prevent their breakdown when they're exposed to sunlight. But when tiny wear particles from the tires accumulate near roadways and then are exposed to sunlight, and then they can be transformed into, the chemical can be transformed into 6-PPD quinone, which is a powerfully toxic compound to some species of fish. So this study is examining the environmental fate and effects of 6-PPD quinone. The study is being led by Kristen Nielsen from the University of Texas and Jose Rodriguez, an ISD ELA scientist. And again, it'll look at potential effects at lower concentrations that went, than what might uh, be killing uh, fish on the West Coast. So sublethal effects and how that affects the entire operation of an ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. Again, one of the uh, examples of how we're looking at, uh, you know, immediate impacts of humans on our aquatic ecosystems. The pandemic has raised another issue that we're studying. Specifically, we're all using more types of cleaning solutions. And the main active ingredients in a lot of these uh, chemicals are compounds called quaternary ammonium compounds or QACs. So an estimated 25% of QACs that are used annually actually end up being discharged directly into the environment. So wastewater treatment plants, of course, remove a lot of these compounds, about 90%, um, primarily through uh, the aerobic degradation and preferential binding to the sludge, the uh, wastewater or sewage sludge. But increasing use of these QACs 
during and after the pandemic can overwhelm the wastewater treatment uh, plant capacity to remove them, and those can increasingly find their way into our waterways. The same activity that makes these effective cleaners may also make them toxic to freshwater systems. And so we're studying the fate and the effects of these chemicals, again, in a whole ecosystem type setting. Uh, we're using enclosures this year. So this, again, is a large collaborative study. It includes partners from universities of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, McMaster, Windsor, Guelph, Ontario Tech University, and two universities in Scotland who are helping us to look at antimicrobial resistance um, and the evolution of that. Uh, next slide, please. So for many of our projects, um, the overall goals may be lo to look at, you know, impacts on a whole ecosystem of, for example, QACs or 6-PPD quinone. But within those projects, developing new and better ways to measure our environment and to do that in a minimally invasive way is a lot of, uh, of what we try and do. So over the past several years, we've used something called environmental DNA as a tool to see what organisms are living in our lakes and around our field station. Environmental DNA refers to fragments of DNA that are in the water, the air, or the soil, and that come from uh, lost skin cells, feces, sperm or eggs, or even dead organisms that find their way into these, uh, these systems. So there are enough fragments of DNA that we can isolate them from a water sample. We take that water sample into the lab, we amplify that DNA signal, and that allows us to identify organisms without ever needing to capture them or even to see them. So one of our new scientists, Dr. Lisa Peters, is leading an exciting new ecology-focused project looking at the potential expanding habitat of the central newt, these cute little guys at the left-hand side here. This is a collaboration with uh, Dr. Margaret Docker at the University of Manitoba. So there's some preliminary data to suggest that the central newt is expanding its habitat range, and that's possibly related to climate change. The issue is that as it expands its habitat range, central newts may prey upon the eggs of both western and eastern tiger salamanders. And these are species of concern and endangered species, respectively, according to the Committee on the Status of Endangered Species in Canada, COSUIC. So with climate change, we could see a, a change in sort of how this invasive species may affect other uh, endangered species. Uh, next slide, please. The last project I want to talk about is uh, something that I've been talking about for a few years now. If you've been following the research that we've done at ELA over the past few years, you know we've been working on finding better ways to clean up oil spills. This is a collaboration with government, industry, and many, many academic partners. The freshwater oil spill remediation study was a five-year project just wrapping up now that I was helping to lead, and it was looking at how effective less invasive methods are for cleaning up oil. So not digging and dredging, uh, removing soil from the shorelines. In this case, we used enclosures to isolate areas of the shoreline to contain model oil spills. And we found that using fertilizers to stimulate the, acteria, the activity of bacteria was very effective for reducing concentrations of the oil in the water column to near baseline in under 100 days. So that's a really effective, minimally invasive way to treat oil spills. But we wanted to see if the more aggressive way of, of cleaning up oil spills actually had a greater impact. Uh, and so we have this year excavated shorelines inside four of our enclosures that were formerly used for oil spills. And you can see sort of the picture of an a typical enclosure at the top right before the excavation and after the excavation at the bottom. So it's a pretty invasive method for, for removing oil again. So in total, we removed over 1,100 pounds of shoreline material, that's vegetation, roots, uh, and soil. And we removed it, homogenized it, and we'll be uh, submitting it for analysis to look at whether or not there was any oil left in the shoreline. And then we'll be following the enclosures uh, to look at whether or not the physical disruption of that shoreline has any effect on the productivity of those ecosystems. So that's just a snapshot of uh, about seven of the different projects that are going on here uh, at the Experimental Lakes area. There are other ones, but uh, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll stop there and I'll pass it back to uh, to Pauline. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vince. It's really exciting. And it just, I don't know, just listening to you talk about the variety of different studies and, and research and research partners that we have uh, out working out at ELA this year, 
uh, it really hits home about how far we've come since 2014 when we were just starting to sort of figure out if we could make this whole thing work. So congratulations to everybody who's working on these studies and, and everyone who's out at camp this year. It's pretty incredible. Um, so we're focusing on science for this presentation, but uh, none of this would be possible. We wouldn't be able to get anything done if it were not for our operations team who are constantly working tirelessly in the back of the scenes. Um, this year, they have been more flexible than ever uh, as our amazing cooks are working out of this kitchen trailer that we lovingly call the Purple People Feeder. Uh, so shout out to James, Jen, Kieran, and Israel, uh, and really thanks for everything that you and the whole operations team do. So next up, I've got Lee Renchuk and Lauren Hayhurst to explain some of the tools, both old and new, that help them get their work done monitoring fish health and populations. Over to you, Lee. So on the lower tech side for Fish Crew, we actually have quite a few items that would maybe satisfy uh, that homemade sort of nature of things. But what I'm going to talk about today is a way that we collect fish diet samples. And so we call this the Vomitron. And it's just your run of the mill sort of plastic water bottle with some tubing into the end. And this piece of equipment is really special because it allows us to non-lethally see what a fish is eating instead of the typical method of catching a fish, cutting it open, opening its stomach, and seeing what's in there. And so we use this when we try to sample the diets of lake trout. Um, and so lake trout, cold water loving species, will angle for them often in the spring and in the summer and again in the fall uh, in different lakes out here. Uh, see what they're eating at different times of the year and what different individual fish um, have preferences for as well. Uh, the important thing is this fish contributes one meal to us, uh, it doesn't get killed in the process, and potentially we resample it again and again for its stomach content. For its stomach content. So on the higher tech side on fish crew, we use a couple of types of tags to understand things about our fish. So their behavior um, and to look at how many, uh, how many there are in the population. So for that, we use uh, pit tags in our mark recapture program. And these have just a little chip that we implant into the fish with a needle. And then we use our reader to scan the fish to see what its tag number is. So this is a unique ID that allows us to identify individual fish um, to see when we've caught them and how big they've been. The other type of tag we're using is an acoustic telemetry tag, which um, allows us to spy on the fish. It gives us 3D positions of the fish in the lake 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Um, the tags last for about three and a half years. And during that time, um, every couple of minutes, they send out a ping, which tells us where the fish is in the lake spatially. And also because there's a pressure sensor on the end, um, it tells us what depth the fish is at in the water column. So these tags are also individually coded. And so we know which fish, which pit tag has which telemetry tag. Um, and so we can learn about individual fish behavior over time. Awesome, fantastic, that's good. I'm just trying to figure out is my voice on. I hope you can all still hear me. Uh, I love that Vomitron so much as the two girls who played, spent years playing ringette. Every time I see that sports bottle for another use, it's just so great, it makes me smile. It's a perfect example of, uh, how we roll up our sleeves and get things done with the tools that we have. So now we're going to try and go back to ELA. Um, let's try and call Paul from our hydrolimnology team uh, and see if we can talk to him live. Paul, are you there? Hello. Hey, Hi. Pauline. Hey. Can you hear me? So can you just tell us a little bit about the hydrolim team and what you guys do? Sure, yeah. So my name's Paul. Uh, I'm a hydrolim technician. Hydrolim is just a sort of short form for hydrology and limnology. So that's the study of water moving across the land and the study of lakes. Uh, so yeah, basically our crew samples all of the active lakes each year. Uh, we go out and collect physical water samples or use uh, sensors to collect data. Um, so the lakes that we sample are uh, long-term ecological research lakes. So there's a suite of five lakes that uh, we don't do anything to every year. We just go there, collect samples, collect data, and they act as references for all of the experiments going on. 
Um, they give us insight into widespread changes in the area due to weather and climate, um, things that occur on regional or the global scale. Um, and we also collect data and samples from study lakes. So these could be lakes that don't have anything ongoing yet, but we will be using them in the coming year. So we wanna collect some baseline pre-experiment data. Um, they could be lakes that have experiments ongoing, uh, like Vince mentioned, uh, eutrophication or microplastics or what have you. Um, and they also include lakes that are in recovery post-experiment. Uh, so we basically continue to sample and monitor the lakes after the experiments um, to make sure they get back to the pre-experiment condition. So our crew collects uh, hydrometric data, which includes uh, flow, any flow into and out of lakes. Um, and we also keep track of lake levels to know how much water is residing in the lake. Um, and we also collect water chemistry samples that we bring back to the chemistry lab to analyze for things like DIC uh, and many other things. Um, so it's samples and data that give us an idea of the composition of the water itself, things like temperature, oxygen, dissolved nutrients, um, and stuff that, that um, yeah, to, to get an understanding of the lake itself. Um, and yeah, so we use a variety of field sampling equipment from pumps to and hoses to simple manual stuff um, to high frequency sensors and data loggers. So can you give us an example of, uh, oh, it looks like everybody's coming yeah. from the field. Hey guys. Awesome. Sorry, what was that, Pauline? Do you have an example of uh, a, some tool that you that we've been using at ELA since we started in 1968? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, this is the perfect one. This is our Stucky disk. Uh, so this is a very simple manual tool that uh, it's got white and black, uh, and it's got a marked rope with little increments marked on it. We use this every time we sample, and it's uh, it gives us uh, an idea of water clarity and um, water color. So uh, the Secchi depth, so basically lowering this down to the lake till we can't see it, and then bringing it back up till we can, that's the Secchi depth. That gives us an idea of light penetration into the lake. So what we call the photic zone, basically where, where we can expect algae to be photosynthesizing or where you might find macrophytes growing on the, the lake bottom. Um, and then we also look at the white section while it's underwater uh, to determine the color of the water. And so that'll give us an idea of, for example, if it's a brown color or it's murky, maybe that's the you know sedimentation in the water, or if it's a green color, that might indicate algal growth, that sort of thing. Um, the nice thing about the Secchi disc, or one of the great things about Secchi disc is it's very simple no batteries, it's hard to break. Um, people can make them, you can use them. Uh, there's citizen science groups that do uh, an annual Secchi dip in where everyone takes a Secchi measurement at their own, at the lake that they visit most. Uh, and people use these around the world. So it's all very comparable data. It's always the same method. Um, so it contributes to a huge data set kind of around the world. And so, yeah, we use it every single time we go. That's cool. Amazing. Just so simple and, uh, yeah. and yet effective. How about new technology? What's something new that you guys have incorporated into your program in recent years? Yeah, so probably the most impressive thing. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> so this is, uh, it's, this is an RBR brand. Uh, it's just a multi-parameter probe. So basically it's got five or six different uh, probes on it that uh, log data multi times a second, it's high frequency data. Um, we basically use this to supplement the chemistry samples that we collect. So we go out and collect water samples to bring back to the lab. And those are uh, you know, run on really high precision, high accuracy equipment in the chemistry lab, but they're limited by where we can sample. So five meter depth or 10 or wherever we've decided to sample, we can't sample the entire lake the whole way. And so that's where this, this comes in. It's got a lot of the similar sensors on it that, that to detect what the chemistry lab detects, but we can do the entire lake from surface to bottom. Um, so it basically gives us a much more detailed view of what's going on in the lake. So for example, 
versus Seki, this sensor here is the light sensor. Uh, we can tell exactly how the light is changing the entire way down the water column and we can figure out where that maybe chlorophyll peak is where the algae are growing. Um, or the oxygen sensor can tell us where fish might inhabit or not. Um, so yeah, this thing basically gives us a ton of data on the lake that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Um, and we use the, we compare this data to the chemistry lab data to make sure that everything is matching up properly, that we're getting the highest quality data that we can. Cool. That's, yeah, also amazing technology and super interesting. And just, yeah, it's interesting to see how we can collect more data um, over time and that can just tell us more. So, Paul, just to conclude, like, why should we care about all this? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, water is our most precious resource. Uh, water is life. Um, field sampling and collecting data on water is one way that we can get a deeper understanding of what's going on in the lakes, uh, seeing what changes are happening around the world or um, locally and changes that um, are caused by all sorts of things. If it's, an, if it's a human caused change from uh, whatever land use change or pollution to stuff that we're seeing just happening on a regional scale. Um, getting more data is always a good thing. It provides us with uh, so, you know, data to come up with solutions to those problems that we find uh, that we face globally. And it also gives us um, evidence to that we can use to push to protect water here and around the world. So yeah, it's uh, essential to uh, our understanding of what, of what lakes are experiencing. That's awesome. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. And I hope you, uh, yeah, get some lunch and have a good afternoon. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to be, uh, yeah, in the 55th season. And here's to another 55 of learning what water can teach us. Yeah. See ya. Um, don't. Um, so to build on everything that Paul just told us, we thought you might be interested in seeing this short infographic video that we did this year, which explains our monitoring program and some of the new in situ equipment that we're testing and using um, this year. Did you know that at IISD Experiment to Lakes area, scientists can sample water from a lake without leaving the comfort of their desk? Here at the world's freshwater laboratory in northwestern Ontario, we've been tracking the health of our lakes for over 50 years. This means checking in periodically to learn, say, what the temperature is, or how much phosphorus is in the lake, or dissolved oxygen, or carbon. Every one of these things reveal to us how the health of lakes is changing over time and allow us to understand the reasons for these changes. Traditionally, our researchers would have to grab some waders or jump into a boat and physically take samples of the lake water at different spots and depths of the lake, come rain, shine, or even snow and ice. Using these methods, we've built one of the biggest and most important environmental data sets in the world. And now, we're diving into new technologies to find innovative ways to help us understand our fresh water. This is where instruments we call in-situ sensors come in. In one of our 58 freshwater lakes, we've launched a new solar power platform from Aquatic Life Limited called the AquaHive, along with a series of sensors to float on the lake. Those sensors frequently collect data about the state of the lake, such as how much chlorophyll is in the water or what the temperature is, and that bounces off a satellite to our computers, laptops, and cell phones, where we can track and analyze the data without ever leaving our desks. And it's not just at IISD Experiments Lakes area. We've also partnered with Aquatic Life Limited to place similar systems in the Winnipeg River system in Manitoba. These systems are placed at different spots along the river to track and deliver information in near real time. All this matters to scientists, but this emerging real time technology will also allow us to share much more easily what we discover with other researchers, the public, and policymakers who make important decisions to protect the health of our freshwater supplies for generations to come. Learn more at IISD.org slash ELA. Uh, I love that video. There, it is one of a series that we have done on a number of past experiments uh, and ongoing work. And so if you like it, look on our website under videos. Uh, there's quite a few there that are pretty good. 
Also, shout out to Aiden, who's one of our newest members of our team, and will be working on the in-situ monitoring um, area of work moving forward, uh, even and in an even bigger way at ELA. So hopefully we can tell you even more about that next year. Um, okay, so now we're going to go to questions. I'm going to bring Vince back uh, to help answer them, and Emily is going to come and help as well. So maybe if we could... Uh, Stop sharing the presentation, Sumit, and uh, we'll just go to Vince, Emily, and I. Emily, I think you're going to read the questions, and uh, Vince and I will do our best to answer them. Yep. Uh, all right. Thanks so much for amazing presentations. Um, the first question we have is directed at Vince. So you mentioned that reducing nitrogen discharges from wastewater might not be effective for limiting algal blooms. Why is that? Yeah, so some of the work that's, uh, thank, first of all, thanks for the question. Some of the work that's been done here at the Experiment Lakes area has shown that even when you reduce uh, nitrogen inputs, uh, there are bacteria present in a system that are capable of taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and fixing it and, you know, importing it into the system. Um, so some of the current hypothesis is that it's really iron that needs to be available for those bacteria to be able to do that. So it may be that limiting iron might be the key step in limiting uh, algal blooms. And so that's really the crux of one of the studies that's going on here uh, the REAM study that I talked about before and the former study called Form Bloom. Uh, again, this is, you know, so one of the most important areas of research that we are undertaking here at the Experimental Lakes area is really understanding, you know, many years back, it was understanding how phosphorus facilitates algal blooms. And now it's understanding under what conditions uh, will reducing uh, nitrogen be effective if we can also limit the availability of iron. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question is, what is the average length of the studies at ELA? And also, what is the longest running study we've ever done? Yeah, the longest running study is easy to answer, and that's the eutrophication study. Again, uh, Lake uh, 227 has been eutrophied for 50 plus years, right? Um, and the second or the first question is a little harder to answer. What's the average length of studies? Um, we've had very short-term studies here, um, but in general, you know, sort of when we talk about whole ecosystem science, that takes a little longer, and you're probably looking sort of minimum one to three, even five, 10, 15 years. So on average, if I had to come up with an average for all of the whole ecosystem studies, I would think it would probably be in the in over a year for sure, probably in the two to three year range. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so we have another question regarding the wild rice. Uh, so why is it that you're growing wild rice in flooded paddies if they already grow naturally in lakes? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm glad someone asked that. So um, we think of wild rice as, you know, sort of growing in wetlands, growing in lakes naturally, and sort of the traditional ways of harvesting it uh, that we've seen Indigenous peoples do for, you know, thousands of years. Uh, and that's just bending those stalks over into a into a canoe and using the ricing sticks to to make the grains fall off. And I don't think we're we're not looking at developing an alternative to that. I guess we are looking at developing an alternative. We're not looking at developing a replacement. So the issue with that is that wild rice is quite a sensitive plant. First of all, it's an annual plant. It has to reseed itself every year. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I believe that Indigenous people use the methods that they do, because some of those seeds drop off again into the waterway and reseed the, uh, the um, stand of wild rice. Um, but it's a very sensitive plant. So if you if you alter the depth of water, you can really affect how successful that wild rice stand will be the next year. So I mentioned uh, during my presentation that 30 centimeters was thought to be optimum. Well, if you think about sort of hydroelectric dams and how we regulate water levels, uh, and then invasive species, things like Phragmites that can squeeze out uh, wild rice. The fact is that our wild rice production in Canada is, is quite unpredictable. And so what happens oftentimes is we import a lot of the wild rice that is sold uh, to consumers here in Canada from the U.S. And the U.S. produces wild rice 
in a, cult a cultured situation. So they flood fields, they berm them, they flood the field to the optimal depth, they plant the wild rice, and then just before harvest, they'll drain that field and then uh, harvest it with a combine. So producing rice like that, which is you know the traditional way of producing rice as well, is facilitates conditions that produce the methane and the CO2. So we're trying to see whether or not we can facilitate uh, a better way of growing wild rice and also reducing water use and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you so much. Um, so as far as I can see, there's only one last question. If others have questions, please put them in the Q&A. It's not too late. Um, but this one is regarding the Prove It study. Um, so how can you actually be sure that you're removing all of the oil from the water? Yeah, so that's another good question. So the reason that, well, first of all, the oil is the, we conducted those model oil spills in 2019 and 2021, and we saw the concentrations of the oil in the water inside those enclosures decline to near baseline uh, within 100 days. So our sensitive instruments, and we're using state-of-the-art instrumentation here, so, uh, you know, the uh, analysis all gets done at the Center for Oil and Gas Research and Development at the University of Manitoba. We quantify over 40 different compounds that are part of the oil. So we know that the concentrations are below detection limits in the, in the water. What we wanted to know was, okay, so we knew exactly how much oil we added. We knew exactly how much we recovered in the first phase and then in the second phases. Uh, there's still some unaccounted for. So we reasoned that some of it would be in that shoreline and that's why we excavated it to remove it. So it was a really, it was, you know, sometimes what we do is very, uh, elegant in terms of scientific solutions. Other times it's just pure grunt work. So we dug out all that soil, put it into garbage cans, hauled it off site, uh, and then sifted through it, homogenized it. In other words, we used uh, picks and shovels to, to grind it up into very fine particles and then subsampled it. And we'll, we'll analyze those subsamples for any oil. Now, if there is any oil detected, we have to go back to those plots and excavate more until we don't find any, right? That's that's our commitment to use this facility is that we have to return those conditions or those systems to their original condition. So that's what we're, we're committed to doing for this project. All right, thank you so much, Vince. I don't see any further questions. So uh, I will pass things back to Pauline to wrap us up. Can I say one more thing? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, I mentioned a bunch of the, the PIs, the principal investigators for each one of these studies. But it's really important that that everybody understands that nothing gets done here without students. Like we're we're first of all training the next generations of, of scientists here in, in Canada, but we're also um, dependent on their labor. They're in, extremely enthusiastic. They're extremely well, you know, motivated people, and they make the science run here. So I just wanted to shout out to all the students that really make this place run. Thanks, Vince. I could not agree more. Um, we have always been so fortunate to have an amazing and many of us, our stories started out as students uh, at ELA. So, you know, those students are really going on to, to change the world and to be kind of all over the world. We meet uh, ELA students in an amazing variety of places and, and organizations. So thanks to all of you for all your work. Uh, okay, so this brings us to the end of our program. Um, I really want to say that none of this work would be possible without all of you. Um, this year, I am very happy to be recognizing four core framework donors. So these are mostly government, but they are large donors that have helped us cover and are moving forward, helping us cover many of our operations and science costs, so our core costs of what we do. Um, and are required to keep this work going. So the province of Ontario, who have been amazing partners on the ground with everything that we do from infrastructure to science, um, and they've been with us since ISD took over ELA in 2014. So we would definitely not be here without Ontario, thank you. Uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, who specifically support our long-term monitoring program, uh, new last year, Environment Canada and Climate Change, who are helping us move forward in priority science areas and providing much needed funding for infrastructure. And our newest uh, framework uh, donor, which is the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, 
for whom we're so thankful for the operation support and very, very proud to be part of the amazing science community that CFI brings us into. Um, we do, of course, still need your support, um, and we couldn't do any of this without you. We have a large number of other donors and individuals, and we thank you all for every dollar uh, that you give. Uh, also, social media shares and conversations around the dinner table really help. Uh, we are looking to be known here in Canada for what we do, and we're looking to inspire the next generation of freshwater enthusiasts. So that's all of you. So please spread the work about the work that we do, spread the word about the work that we do, um, and you know, reach out if you have questions uh, or comments. Um, we really love to hear from all of you. We currently have a spring fundraising campaign, which is highlighting the microplastics project and how your support um, helps this kind of groundbreaking research at ELA. So if you have the means, we appreciate every dollar. Um, and I hope you've heard today a little bit about how we're putting those dollars to use. Uh, so a huge thank you to all of you for being here and spending the time uh, and to all the freshwater enthusiasts who've contributed in so many different ways and make what we do possible. Thanks again. Have a great field season for everyone at ELA uh, or going to ELA or has been at ELA uh, and for all of the scientists out there doing really amazing, important work on freshwater. Thanks again. Have a great year, everyone. Uh, stay tuned.